All right. Everyone is pouring in right now, so we'll give it a minute, but welcome to everyone who's joined so far. This will be our presentation today. We have uh, really great talks from both Luca Pacenti and John Luca Arwan. Um, Luca Pacenti is from the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research, and the research that he is going to be sharing with us today is going to be published next week on October 10th. So keep an eye out for that, um, and we'll share those details when it's out. And then we also have John Luca Arwan from the University of Bath, who is finishing writing up right now for his PhD and his research. Um, they're both related and really great. So we will have those today. While we're still waiting for a few people to pour in, I'll just remind everyone of our research soundings competition that we're hosting. Um, this is basically just like a fun way to get everyone involved with their research, uh, sharing it and doing it in a creative way. So coming up with soundings based on your research um, with no human audio, but just acoustic noise. And so, yeah, get those in by November 17th. All of the details are on our website um, and you can submit those uh, soundings to our email here, underwater at acoustics.ac.uk. Um, and on our social media in the next few weeks, we'll keep sharing some examples from last year, which are really fun to listen to. And to incentivize everyone, there are prizes as well. In addition, just we host these webinars every month. So if you have a talk that you want to give at the webinar, or if you know someone who might have some interesting research to uh, give, then please do reach out. Again, you can use our Underwater at Acoustics email, or you can get in touch with me directly. Um, also, our social media is there. Uh, so whatever avenue you prefer, definitely reach out if you have something that you want to share. Um, and again, just for the last few people who have poured in, we will be talking today with Luca Pacenti and John Luca Adwan. We'll be starting uh, with Luca from the Royal Netherlands Institute. Um, yeah, Luca, if you want to take it away. Uh, yeah, I can start in uh, sharing uh, my screen. It's uh, here. Uh, share. Uh, here. Sorry, while you're pulling that up, I forgot to say, if you have any questions uh, throughout the presentations, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. So if you think of anything throughout the presentation, definitely write it down and we'll get it later. Okay, uh, first, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to give uh, uh, the seminar. Uh, the work that I to present today is a uh, collaboration uh, between NEOS and Teno and that's been funded as the ACO project and I will acknowledge like all the cultures that uh, participated uh, in this uh, research, and I want Luca, you cut out for a minute there. Uh, nice. Okay. Uh, share my screen again. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh... Okay. Uh... To, to start, uh, so it's going to be around 20 minutes talk. I start with a general introduction about uh, climate change, and then I talk a little bit about my methods. Then I, I'm going to present some results, then some uh, discussion, and just a uh, final summary. Uh, so introduce uh, the topic. I'm going to talk about uh, the impact uh, of uh, anthropogenic noise in general of, no uh, of noise uh, propagation in the ocean itself. And uh, the main sound sources, uh, anthropogenic sound sources in the ocean are given by shipping, resource exploration, and infrastructure uh, development. And you can see that a big source is uh, shipping uh, because it's basically like everywhere. It increased like multiple times in the past 50 years. In the paper of uh, Malakoff in uh, 2020 found that this increase was by 32 times and it's meant to increase also in the, in the future up to like 1000% uh, by 2050. Uh, so everyone knows that like uh, climate change is uh, produced by the production of uh, anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gases, and this uh, main gas is uh, CO2. 
Uh, the main point that uh, I want to make here uh, that depending on the climate scenario that you consider, uh, so you can see this plot, this amount of CO2 in the atmosphere that you have, and the different lines are different climate scenarios. You can have an extreme scenario, which is the 8.5. That means that uh, we are not going to mitigate uh, climate change or the 2.6 that we start to mitigate the climate change now. Uh, but uh, climate change is also an effect on the ocean, and the main effect uh, are ocean warming, sea ice loss, ocean acidification, and uh, also like um, the amount of sea ice that uh, that we have. But the the main uh, the main topics that we're gonna talk about today is the rate of temperature, and you can see that uh, the temperature is like uh, rising already. Uh, that's for two different climate scenarios. In red, it's the most extreme uh, extreme scenario over time in the degree Celsius. And in blue, we have the less extreme scenario for a plot A and B. Uh, you can see that for the most extreme scenario, the surface temperature can increase uh, by four or five degrees Celsius. And then there is like a plot D about the CS extent, but we are not going to talk about that uh, today much. Uh, but it's also like important that if we consider that the amount of ice that we, we have is going to like decrease, so like the uh, salinity of the water is going to decrease, and then there is a third effect on E that is the um, uh, ocean acidification, so the acidity of the ocean that is also projected to decrease if you consider uh, the most extreme scenario for a decrease up to like 0 0.5. But also like in the acoustic world, uh, the effect of climate change uh, is started to be acknowledged now. Uh, one of the first paper published was uh, from Afatari et al. Uh, they look at the changes of uh, sound speed uh, from now to the end of the century up to different depths at 50 and uh, 500 meters. And you can see the two plots at the top and at the bottom. And a red value, it means that uh, we have an increase of uh, sound speed and a blue value that we have a decrease of sound speed. But you can see that in general, everywhere, there is a general increase of uh, sound speed. And the only region, even if you cannot see very well here, is in the North Atlantic, where we have a general like decrease of uh, sound speed. Uh, and then in this paper, they consider like a single region in the North Atlantic and they look at the changes of uh, sound speed that we're going to have for the future. So we have the red curve, that means that that's uh, the future for the sound speed, and the, and the green curve that is uh, the actual value that we have now. And you can see that in general, there is a general increase in the region they consider, but there is a sound speed minimum popping up around 50 meters. And it's mainly given by this plot on the left, that is uh, the temperature value that you, you can see there at, uh, at the surface that there is like a, a general like a, a increase of uh, of um, of uh, temperature there, but there is a new uh, new temperature minimum appearing there. And then they they look in this paper at like transmission loss at this depth, having uh, uh, um, marine mammals as a sound source. Uh, that's a like, transmission loss in decibel over a range of uh, distance over uh, five kilometers. And we have the future value in red and the present value in green. And you can see that the transmission loss in the future is going to be different. So it means that we're going to have a change in the sound propagation. Uh, another effect that has been acknowledged uh, a little bit uh, before is the effect of, uh, of pH. It has a large effect on absorption. And you can see this uh, uh, nice plot here where we have like a delta pH uh, for the end of the century over frequency and uh, how much the sun absorption is going to change. Uh, we saw a couple of slides uh, ago that if we have like uh, an ocean acidification around uh, 0 0.5, uh, that's quite possible for the most extreme scenario, uh, then we, we have like a decrease of sun absorption by 50 to 60%. Uh, in the same paper, Lynn et al., uh, they also look at different regions, especially the Pacific and the Atlantic region. Uh, we have in the top plot on A, we have a pH over time. You can see that the pH is basically projected to decrease everywhere for the most extreme scenario. And then, like therefore, also like the absorption is going to decrease in all these um, regions uh, for a decrease of uh, 200 Earths, about 56%, as we have still here on the plot on the left and at three kilohertz, a uh, smaller decrease. But the point I want to make here is quite important that sun absorption, when we look at low frequencies, we have a high percentage decrease, but the absolute value is quite small because it goes to the 10 to the minus three. Instead, when we go at this like a mid frequency around like between one to five kilohertz, I would say that the values are uh, much larger. They can go up to like 0 0.22. So that the, the, the effect is gonna be like a more visible, I, I believe. Uh, but also, like it depends at what uh, what scenario we are looking at. Uh, for example, when the sound is trapped in uh, a channel, 
in a, uh, in a duct or in a silver channel, uh, this effect is going to be quite larger. Uh, that's like a, an, an example for uh, the B4C, so uh, close to Canada, uh, where uh, Dure told they look at uh, uh, propagation of sound, just looking at um, uh, ocean acidification effect. Uh, you, and you can see on the plot at the bottom where there is like the distance and the frequency that we consider on the, on the Y and um, uh, in the increase of mass of sound at 300 kilometers. Uh, that's the deck, how it's colored. And you can actually see the largest effect is going is going to be around like um, um, one to two kilohertz. Uh, I quite like it. this plot; is uh, it's quite good to understand what is happening. Uh, so, like at the end, they uh, calculated an increase up to like uh, seven decibel when we could see the like the mid frequency of uh, one kilohertz. Uh, given this uh, this context, uh, we wanted to understand better how some propagation was going to change from now to the end of the century and what are the effects that are causing it. Uh, in our study, we considered two different uh, climate scenarios. The most extreme one that is the 8.5 that you can see on the plot from Craig here, 2017, where it projects that there is no mitigation of climate change. It's going to be a continuous increase of uh, temperature and CO2 in the atmosphere as well. And the 4.5 is at the moment the most likely scenario to start mitigating um, climate change about 2040. And then over time, we have a decrease of, uh, of temperature and CO2 in the atmosphere. That is the yellow scenario here. Uh, we, keep it, we keep it very simple. So we just have a, a single sun source uh, that is a, a single ship, a, a bulker. And we also use a single frequency of 125 Hertz. Uh, we calculate the propagation loss using a parabolic equation model, this RAM. Uh, we, uh, assume that uh, ambient noise is just given uh, by wind noise and calculate this using Ainsley 2010. And we consider all climate variables uh, that they are affected by climate change. So like atmospheric, seawater temperature, salinity, acidity, and also like a wind speed. And also we try to isolate the effect of uh, sun absorption. Uh, as in the case of Avatar at all, uh, we try to see uh, the changes of uh, sun speed. Uh, from now to the end of the century. So a red value means an increase of sound speed and a blue value means like a decrease of sound speed. We consider uh, four different depths, five, 125, 300, and 640 meters. Uh, we can see that also in our case, there is a general uh, increase of, uh, of sound speed. But the point that uh, I really want to make here that is going to be quite important in the presentation is this uh, uh, hole uh, of um, let's say, of a decrease of uh, sound speed uh, in the North Atlantic region close to Iceland. And you can see that just in the top 125 meters, and then we, you, you can see like a sharp increase in, uh, in sound speed. And what is quite nice, it is also consistent uh, with the two different climate scenarios. So in that's the less extreme climate scenario, you can see that it is a smaller uh, increase in sound speed in general in, uh, worldwide, uh, but this decrease in sound speed is uh, visible in uh, both scenarios. And then, like when we go deeper, uh, under 300 meters, there is like a general uh, increase of uh, sound speed. Uh, we also look at the effect of uh, sun of sun absorption. That like how it's going to change, uh, but like by the end of the century, you can see that the scale is uh, quite small. The value is uh, 10 to the minus four. Uh, again, I consider like uh, uh, four different depths. Uh, and you can see that the largest uh, decrease is going to be visible, of course, in the Arctic region in the surface layer. That makes sense because it's in contact uh, with atmospheric uh, CO2. But the absolute value, again, is uh, is quite small. So we expect it to the fact to be quite uh, negligible, if you can say. And then there is like, we also consider the other scenario. It's a less extreme scenario. And you can see that the changes are uh, even smaller uh, in this case. Uh, so given like uh, in this context, you can see all the black dots here are uh, the regions that uh, we, uh, we're we going to discuss today. Uh, so like we have the Arctic, Antarctica, and the North, the North Atlantic region. That's the region that we mainly care about. Uh, so in our study, we consider uh, two different uh, seasons, uh, the summer and the winter season. Uh, and here you can see the sound speed profile that uh, we use for our study. Uh, then we consider uh, two different climate scenarios, the 4.5 and the 8.5. And you and you can see that for uh, the future scenarios that are in the yellow, violet, green, and light blue, uh, there is like a general increase of uh, sound speed in the northwest Atlantic, 
ocean, but you can see that the sound speed minimum that we are seeing around 50 meters is going to be more marked. And it's also like a weakening you can you can see of the deep sound channel. In, in our case, uh, we consider like a single source that is uh, placed at zero uh, there and at six meter depth. And you can see that uh, on the Y, we have the depth of the water column. Uh, on the X, we have the, the distance and it's colored on some pressure level total. So we just show the values when the ship noise is larger than the wind noise. So that's we, we assume that's uh, the noise that we have in this region, having one vessel and just like um, a wind noise is, of course, a simplification. And at the, at the, at the top, we have the winter season. At, at the bottom, we have the summer season. Uh, you can see that in general for the two different uh, clam uh, climate scenarios, 4.5 and 8.5, there is a general increase of uh, sound speed in the top uh, 200 meters. And we, if we consider this value over distance, uh, we calculated an increase up to seven decibels. It is like a quite uh, quite significant for the formation of this new dot. Also considering because most of uh, marine life uh, lives in the top 200 meters of the water column. Uh, we also consider the east part of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Uh, that's the the region that's uh, in that's in front of Europe. And there is also the formation of uh, a new surface dock, especially during uh, during winter in this case. And we also have a weakening and a deepening of uh, the deep sound channel in this case as well. Uh, so looking at the results, uh, the results are a little bit uh, a little bit different because uh, some of the rays uh, they managed to leave the surface look. Uh, but the general the general in increase is uh, is visible for uh, the winter for the winter season especially uh, for the summer season is a little bit less visible. But again, also like uh, in uh, this region, there is an increase up to like uh, three decibels. So like if you can summarize for the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we have the new formation of a new surface duct that is going to be especially important for sound sources placed at, uh, at the surface layer because sound called ink is called um, uh, propagates further and therefore uh, the top 20 meters are going to be noisier over the future. Uh, we also look at the other regions, uh, even, even more in the paper that is coming out uh, next week. Uh, that's the Southern Ocean where we have a general increase of sound speed, but we don't have a formation of uh, a new duct. And you can see here that uh, that's for the winter at the top and again for the summer at the bottom. Uh, that the values are uh, are quite similar. There is not a general uh, general change in sound uh, propagation itself. So just just an increase of uh, sound speed is not sufficient uh, to change the environment where we are in, where we consider sound. And then the second uh, the second region uh, outside the North Atlantic that uh, we consider is the Pacific Ocean, and you can see in general there is not a formation of a surface duct. And it gets like even weaker over time. So like it's actually noisier uh, in, the, in the scenario that we are considering now. Uh, and you can see it better and it's get like uh, more and more marked uh, if we consider uh, the most uh, the most extreme uh, the most extreme scenario. So it's really important um, in our case, uh, the region that you look at the the fact uh, is going to be of course uh, uh, different. Uh, but when we got like uh, this, a result at the beginning, we got quite excited, but we couldn't understand uh, what was happening. Uh, so by by study, I'm uh, an uh, oceanographer, so like I, I know like this processes, the current system, and all this sort of stuff. And the the stratification in North Atlantic is uh, mainly given uh, by the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation System that is called like AMOC, where there is like a warm and saline like a water flow that is moving northward uh, towards the Arctic, and there is like a, a second system that is uh, moving southward in front of the uh, North, North North American coast that is cold and less saline. And this system due to climate change is. Uh, uh, slowing down, mainly given by uh, ice melting. And here you can see uh, how it's slowing down uh, for the two different climate scenarios we consider, for the 8.5 in blue and for the 4.5 in uh, in red. Uh, what is like a quite interesting here, uh, that for the two different climate scenarios, the decrease of AMOC is, uh, is quite similar. And that explains why the results that uh, we are seeing for the two different climate scenarios for the North Atlantic are uh, quite similar. Uh, but so like uh, what like what is happening in practice 
is that like uh, ice melting is uh, increasing in the North Atlantic, the amount of like uh, cold water that, that uh, are there. Uh, there, therefore, the stratification uh, in the water column is going is going to change. And if you look at the rest of the Atlantic region, the the the, the temperature, that's the temperature in Kelvin, is actually increasing. And that's like a consistent uh, between different studies. So you have on the left, you have the study of uh, Liu et al. 2020, and there is like another study of uh, Boers 2021. They show that uh, there's going to be like this cold hold that is uh, for in in the future. It is mainly given. Uh, by ice melting. So like we can say that the AMOC is responsible for stratification uh, changes that uh, they lead to a reduced polar world oceanic uh, in heat traffic. Uh, but if I haven't convinced you yet, that's uh, the uh, the main driver of this change. Uh, we also uh, calculate the sun pressure level total as a, um, as a median for the top 200 meters for each year. And we plot it against the AMOC strength for each year. Uh, you can see in blue uh, for the most extreme McLaren scenario is 8.5, and we have in red the less extreme some scenario is uh, 4.5. Uh, at first, you can see that there is like a very good uh, agreement uh, between the two variables, uh, but the changes also between the two different climate scenarios are quite consistent. Uh, so that then we can see that at the end, actually, the increase that uh, we gonna see for the two different climate scenarios is seven decibels in uh, both cases. Uh, to go to the final summary, the larger changes in the propagation are given uh, uh, visible in the Northwest Atlantic, uh, it's up to seven decibel for a single vessel. So in a real case scenario, these changes might be even larger, and they are usually connected uh, to uh, to AMOC, and it's also consistent with two different climate scenarios. Uh, the change in sound propagation that we're seeing, the main driver is that the changes in the stratification that we're going to see, uh, that we see, uh, so mainly given by oceanography. And at this frequency, at 125 Hz, the effect of uh, sound absorption is actually quite small. But if we consider like uh, other scenarios or other frequencies, this effect might be quite important. And another thing that uh, is quite in quite interesting is also that uh, potentially we could, we could also use acoustic measurements to monitor the changes of AMOC that is quite important for uh, the North, At North Atlantic environment and, uh, and the weather forecast. Uh, that's all for me. I want to thank you for uh, listening. And if you have any questions, you can just uh, email me later or just uh, like ask me a question later on. Thank you so much, Luca. That was great. Um, so that was his presentation on the contribution of climate change on propagation of shipping noise in the North Atlantic Ocean for those of you who are joining late. Um, and we will switch it over to John Luca now, who's going to be uh, presenting on the long-term effects of ocean temperature rise on the deep sea. And just as a reminder, if you have any questions in the meantime, do please pop them in the chat, and we will get to all the questions at the end after both presentations. Go ahead, John Luca. Can you hear me? Yeah. So hi, uh, I'm Gianluca Audone. I will talk about the long-term effects on ocean temperature um, and the rise on the in the deep sea. Um, the project is so I am a final year Samba student. Samba is a program at the University of Bath, which um, uh, and the project is also in collaboration with the National Physical Laboratory. Matt News, Philippe Blondel, and Chris Budd are my buff supervisor, and Peter Ellis and Stephen Robinson are the supervisors from the National Physical Laboratory. So um, just to say who am I, um, and um, especially for the background, I am a mathematician. Um, I've been doing numerical analysis uh, before in both my uh, bachelor and my master's. Um, so I am a recent uh, underwater acoustician, and I look at this problem in a more mathematical way rather than um, a physics way. And that's why I have uh, two wonderful brilliant supervisors who is going to cover sometimes my physics. So uh, the question about my PhD is, can we hear the evidence of the uh, of for weather and climate change using underwater acoustics? And the short really answer is yes, we can. Um, a bit of motivation about today um, and why study this uh, phenomenon about the, using the sea, uh, even though Luca gave loads of, uh, of motivations. I will say that um, both the sound and the sea surface temperature and also uh, are essential uh, ocean variables and key factor to better understand the Earth's climate. 
Also, um, I will be using um, measurements which are taken in the SOCA channel. So um, the IPCC 2014 uh, stated that uh, the impact of climate change is very hard to assess in the thousand in the kilometers or a thousand meter is very challenging so this is what i tried to probably in my phd so uh the setup we are going to talk about the data um uh, so the data comes from the ctpto um which is a the comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty organization uh which opens in 1996 and the aim is to ban nuclear explosions um, so uh, they use to do so and to monitor the whole world, the, um, the IMS with the 302 facilities worldwide. Um, they have uh, technology like seismic, infrasound, radio nuclide, and other IDO uh, acoustics, which is the one that, I, um, that I'm using. Um, this is the data set. And uh, why is this data set so precious? Um, so um, on the right, we can see a map with all of the uh, red dots indicating all of the um, stations, locations. Uh, and then on the left, we can read why is this data set so precious because it's high resolution. We have a 250 hertz uh, sampling rate, which gives us information about up to 100 hertz. And also the quality of the recording is very high quality, it's 24 bit depth. So we have a maximum dynamic range of 144 decibel. Um, and also this station has been recording the oceans for a long time. Uh, the whole, the 11 stations in the map have been measuring uh, for a minimum of eight years to a maximum of 19 years. Uh, the, long, the oldest station is the one in Australia. Um, so how every station is set up, um, we have a shore facility and then in the solar channel where um, are placed three hydrophones um, with a two kilometer separation distance. Um, there is usually a north and a south stations, the only station that has just one um, uh, one triplet of, um, of hydrophones is Cape Leo in, in Australia. Um, this is my data processing pipeline, pipeline uh, which uh, I will briefly cover. So from the waveform data, um, I am given the waveform and the metadata. So uh, everything gets processed to remove outliers and uh, especially duplicate gaps and overlaps. I then compute two types of statistics and we will be looking at the PSD um, and the SPLs. Uh, so the top part of the of the you can call it diagram. Um, so I compute these using the Welsh method, uh, using a 50% overlap in one minute admin window uh, to reduce petrol leakage. And I uh, use standard third octave bands to uh, do my analysis. Um, I have a broadband, uh, which goes from 1.12 to 100 Hertz um, and all of the other frequency bands. Um, so uh, the long term time analysis, so why am I interested in this and how did everything start? So first thing, uh, uh, the climatic zone. So uh, all of the stations are basically centered around the equator and then all of the, um, and so I'm using the H1 and H11 um, and just for a quick uh, bit. So I am basically at the edge of the dry on the dry and the temperature from the climatic zone for the south. And I am uh, roughly here. So in the dry and tropical climates for Cape Lewin, uh, for Wake Island, which is the north station. Um, so why I, am I interested in, um, in these two stations? So I plotted a spectrogram here for, uh, this is Cape Lewin, so it's Australia. Uh, the top uh, plot is uh, uh, the broadband and the um, bottom plot is a spectrogram for all of the frequency bands. Uh, this is an aggregated plot. So the one minute time series that I showed you before has been then computed and aggregated uh, over day. Um, and so um, by looking at the, at the spectrograms, I was interested, especially in this um, region here, which should be around 20 Hertz. Um, and at these, what I call blob, which uh, appear and disappear in um, in the spectrograms. And I was curious to understand what they were and if we could find any causes of, of that. Uh, the same plot um, appears for the um, uh, for the North Station. So it's near Japan. Um, 
And uh, so this is uh, the, again, the broadband uh, aggregated daily. And here we have the same blob appearing. So this was, why is that there? So um, the 20 Hertz is where usually uh, we find uh, whales. And so um, I did go and investigate this, um, uh, these two stations. Um, I am looking now at the 20 Hertz uh, frequency band. Um, so on the right, uh, on the left hand side here, we can see um, a um, the SPL, the, so the, the time series. Um, um, and on the uh, right, we can see the, the spectrogram. So I wanted to first understand which frequencies compose the signal. I am now looking at an hourly time series. Uh, so to get more information, especially on the daily variations. Um, so um, it's interesting to note, uh, if we look just at the purely at the time series, this double peak, which is sometimes present and goes on and off. Um, the most interesting frequency that we find um, are, well, the daily, the, the daily frequency, uh, the daily, sorry, the um, yearly frequency uh, that we find here. Uh, and then also we can see the, um, the, uh, the the daily frequency of um, of a uh, of the time series, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, we have the roughly the same result for the um, for the north station of Cape of uh, Wake Island. Uh, so we have a daily frequency and a um, an yearly frequency of um, in 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 the same time series. Uh, the second analysis that I did um, is a cross correlation with uh, sea surface temperature. So um, the plot is contains quite a bit of information, which we all try to uh, untangle. Uh, so the top plot uh, represents the cross correlation between the uh, sea surface temperature and um, sun pressure levels. Um, we are, I'm always looking at the, um, the 20 Hertz frequency band. So uh, this is the correlation at uh, time zero. And by looking at here, we are basically in the negative part, we are basically um, having the uh, sun pressure level stay uh, fixed, and we are moving uh, in, in time the sea surface temperature. And um, I zoom, zoomed in uh, the zeros uh, up to minus 19 weeks uh, sea surface temperature. So now we have switched again the, uh, the, the time sequence and we are in weekly data. Um, so uh, at zero, we get a very low correlation and we get this shape, which is a circular shape. Uh, this means that the two time series are uh, out of phase. Um, and as we go along in time, so we are uh, again fixing the sound pressure levels and we are moving um, the um, sea surface temperature to see what um, which which is the correlation we see that at roughly 10 weeks we get a correlation of 0.8 and the um, the two series are now in phase and so we get this line um, meaning that the uh, cross correlation is representing and is finding um, high similarity between the two series and there is also meaning that the line is a, is looking like a straight line uh, it means that the uh, relationship that, it, that it's finding, it's a linear relationship, which is what we want. The same type of analysis, the same type of plot has been done for the south, uh, for the north station, um, which is Wake Island. Uh, again, it's in week, the same top plot to represent the, um, the cross correlation. And we can always uh, see this change in uh, the out of phase uh, for the first um, for the for the first lag, and then as we go along, we find an even higher correlation with 0.95 uh, for um, in around 10, 11 weeks. So again, we have been looking at the effect of um, of the sea surface temperature. Um, 
and how it affects the uh, the sounds in the ocean. So the hypothesis of why of why this is what can in, why there is this correlation and what can cause these two effects that we saw. Well, the early effect is of course the the, the fact that the Earth rotates and it's 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 clear that it's there. But the daily um, the daily peak might be uh, very well explained by the whale activity. Uh, the sea surface temperature might contribute to the um, to the early effect on the warming and um, increasing of the of the temperature, and the whale activity might explain the um, uh, again the um, daily correlation. So, in conclusions, uh, these are the main uh, the two main results. Um, I have highlighted uh, the seasonalities, uh, so the day the yearly and the daily peaks. Uh, in the 20 hertz and say always in the 20 hertz we have uh, the um, uh, highest correlation found after 10 weeks uh, which is uh, roughly a two month lag uh, so we are investigating on why we are finding in both the north and the south these uh, two months lag and um, this is uh, the end of my presentations thank you Thank you, Gianluca. That was great. Um, so for those of you who joined uh, late, those were both of our presentations from Gianluca and Luca, but we will be uh, posting the recording later on YouTube. Uh, so now we have time for questions from anyone uh, for both presentations. So go ahead and pop them in the chat if you have them, and I will read them out for them. Um, to get us started, I uh, had a few questions. So I was going to ask Luca if the findings that you're having, if you are aware of kind of for the future research that you're looking at with kind of predicting what the sound propagation is going to look like in the future, if that is going to be driving future designs for um, acoustical hardware and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, the short question is, uh, I. I am not uh, aware of uh, of anything, uh, but uh, I, I think it's uh, like that climate change is starting to be acknowledged also by the acoustic uh, community thing, uh, and I think it's uh, gonna come like more and more studies looking at that. I think. Okay, great. Um... We have a question from the participants and they're asking, I think this one's probably for John Luca, but both of you feel free to chime in on what are the expected long-term impacts um, of this for whales? Um, yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, I do not study biology, so I'm not uh, a marine biologist, um, but uh, the things that we've seen, so uh, this was a preliminary analysis that I presented. Um, I am looking at other variables and I'm also looking at some other parameters which were too messy to introduce and uh, talk about today. Um, so we have seen uh, also some changes in the mean frequency for these kind of frequency bands, uh, which make us think that it's either... so. Also, everything I think also links in, Luca, you can say no, I might be saying something wrong, but I think that everything links in to what he said as well. So that we are seeing and we are also hearing by looking at the animal uh, differences also in frequency. So all of the all of this point that he's making about the frequencies are changing uh, and the sounds levels are changing, I think I also have seen in other analyses um, and so the impacts are, they are getting louder, maybe because, so they have to basically shout uh, to, to communicate because of the effects of the, of the, of the climate change, which is something uh, I think is also happening with birds for our cities, etc. because the cities got so loud that they, the sounds level in, in the in the birds the, the sound level the the sound that they, they have to produce uh louder so hopefully i answered your question yeah that's great uh that question also last month we had a presentation uh that also was specifically about whales so that one will be up on our youtube if you want to uh, learn more about it um i have a question from the audience, they're raising their hand, so I'll let them ask it in person. Um, 
Looks like you're muted. There you go. Uh, yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I have a question uh, about the. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm not sure that I understand uh, well. You said that uh, you uh, correlate the sound pressure level with the sea surface uh, temperature and the, with the time lag of, for instance, different value that the maximum correlation happened in the around two and a half months. Yeah, am I right? Uh, yes. What I don't understand why it is like that uh, some, uh, I don't know, the spectrum level mm -hmm. is uh, correlated with some physical event, which is for two and a half months ago. Uh, what is um, the meaning of that? I don't know. So, um, I don't have it here, but I know for sure that, for example, um, uh, if you look at the solar altitude and the sea surface temperature, they have a two and a half month, three months, depending on what, where you are on Earth. Um, so, which is basically telling you that in, in three months time, uh, it takes three months for the water either to cool or to warm up. Uh. So we we think um, that, uh, oh, uh, yeah, I, I think we that we got also, sorry, I had the, the, the chat and somebody asked something similar to yours, I think. Uh, I, I will look at that later. Sorry, I got distracted. Um, so um, what we think is um, that uh, the animals are basically feeling this kind of change in temperature, and that's why it takes two months for the sound levels to to basically align uh, to the sea surface temperature. Because by the time that the sea, because also it's a sea surface temperature, we don't have any, uh, we didn't find any data from the uh, from the deep ocean uh, temperature because it's also from out to compute and um so that's the reason why we think about that and uh do you have the uh, sound uh, pressure level for different depths i i'm wondering uh, according to your explanation if you correlate the spl with the sea surface temperature the sound uh, mm -hmm. spl of the for the deeper uh part of the ocean must have the more lag for instance uh if you uh, have uh, the the SPL of the twenty meters, for instance, it is the uh, ten week. But when you go to the deeper, this lag must be shift, and uh, it's uh, take a long longer lag gives you the higher correlation. Yeah, I mean, uh, so um, these kind of stations record sounds from all over, and as you know, the the the, the sounds in the water propagates very nicely. So we get. Um, the area, so these, the, the sea surface temperature that I'm using is covers an area um, around the station. Uh, so, it's not, yeah. it's, so it's not like the sea surface temperature exactly on top of the station. I, I, I have done these analysis for exactly on top of the station and in increased area. But um, as, I, as I increase the area, um, the sea surface temperature regularizes and gets more sinusoidal. So that's why the correlation also increases uh, nicely. But anyway, also if I take just the point temperature on top of the station or roughly near the station, I get a correlation of two months. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, but, but the I don't have, I, I'm using just these recordings, so I don't have any idea of what's going to happen uh, in, deeper in the ocean or higher. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Uh, in the chat, there's one that's pretty similar, but if you have any other thoughts, um, it's from, it says two months seem like a long time for a correlated effect. Any thoughts on reason, speculations? Also, did you think about correlations with other physical or biological parameters? Uh, yeah, so I think I answered the first bit by saying um, that, um, uh, yeah, the, the we, we, we were thinking about the fact that it takes two months roughly to warm the, the water uh, in. So it's that it's kind of, it should be on the same time scale of the, uh, ocean, the ocean water warming up. Uh, other physical effects, since we were uh, interested in this kind of um, uh, effect, we also I also computed the solar altitude, and I have done the same analysis uh, with that. 
uh, but I I can't remember the top of my head the the um the, the time lag. Okay, great. Um, and then let's see. I was curious for Luca. Um, how did you? In one of your slides, you were talking about how you specifically isolated the sound absorption. How? What were your um, means for doing that? Uh, well, uh, the uh, I knew that the fact uh, the fact was small. Uh, uh, this frequency, but um, but it was like I mainly like to uh point out that uh, people should look rather at the uh, changes in temperature and uh, certification. Uh, if you look at low frequency rather than absorption, uh, and also like, I mean, it's it's a large effect. If if you look if you look at paper, uh, the main paper that you find correlated to climate change and sound are related to sun absorption, but that's actually like a quite small effect if you look at changes in temperature and acidification that you have in a water column. Okay, great. Um. Let's see what other questions we have. For Gianluca, I was wondering with kind of that map that you were showing where the data was from, and then you further kind of clarified it's all from pretty dry zones. Do you think that things would be significantly different, like if you were to go towards the poles or very close to uh, the equator? Or what do you think? Um, yes, so I have done also the analysis for the North Atlantic, so for the, for the, it's basically on the equator, and um, you can clearly see the two seasons instead of the four ones that we, we get, um, and uh, I, yeah, usually there are effects that you, you can see. Um, I've used these stations because there was no, um, like, major... Uh, variable that we know about that is influencing that. Uh, so usually the South Cape Lewin one um, is usually near the Antarctica. So people think about that as a main source. The North one is mainly shipping because it's the it's near Japan and the, the Pacific bit where also I think uh, Luca showed a map about the shipping bit. Great. Um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, what would you tell policymakers about the long-term impacts of these findings to assist them with decision-making around climate change? Wow. Both of you feel free to chime in. <laughs> um, Luca, do you have any thoughts? Uh, well, like, uh, if, I, if I can say it's... Uh... Uh, I think that uh, there should be uh, acknowledged as well that the climate change is uh, an effect on the soundscape that uh, we have in the in the ocean. That's uh, gonna have also an, an effect on uh, uh, marine mammals, of, of course, and marine life. And uh, one of the one of the large the large sources uh, is going to be is going to be shipping. So some action needs to be taken uh, for shipping. And if I if I can if I can add to that, it's a uh, I've given like this presentation like uh, uh, a couple of times, and where I get more interest from is uh, from uh, defense. So it's, uh, it's because uh, it has like a direct uh, application for them, and they're doing uh, like a lot of studies directed to that, especially uh, in the Arctic. So it's I think it's also like our work as scientists uh, to let policymakers know that uh, that is happening. And I also want to add that. Uh, uh, Gianluca and Gianluca talk was really good because mine was just like a modeling and stuff, and uh, you were actually looking at the real data. That's uh, that's also what we need. I think. Thanks. <laughs> I think uh, they're uh, both important to have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's wonderful. I, 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 I was. Yeah, I, I think the same. I have like a page loads of notes for me. Mm. I'm like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> um, so about the policymaker bit, I. I, I I think Luca said whatever is, needs to be said. I, I also know uh, that, for example, um, the ocean is getting also interesting uh, interesting from a fact. Um, so there is a design at the design museum in London. There is a, an exhibition about research um, on new technology and how the housing 
things might work. And there is a section about uh, building all of these green energy kind of technology, solar panel, et cetera, which needs rare metals. And now they're thinking, let's go and dig in the ocean. Um, so the shipping bits is going to be increasing a lot, especially. So it's, it's like a, a, a very uh, contrasting part. I don't know, it's like you're trying to build something green, but then you need to go and find these uh, elements in the ocean. So you're digging, you're uh, changing another environment uh, and another ecosystem, et cetera. So, um, yeah, it's it's a very challenging thing. So sh shipping is going to be the 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 thing, as Luca said. Definitely, yeah. I think one of the great things about these talks is like they build off of each other. Your guys's are related, but take kind of different looks at the problem. Um, and with this kind of stuff too, about like policy and how maybe it'll impact um, the marine life and stuff. We've had previous talks that kind of relate to it, so it all really like ties in well together, and it's um, a great field to look into. I think what you were saying about too, like defense being kind of very central for your stuff, Luca, um, makes sense. And I think that's a big area that some people kind of don't necessarily think to consider, but you know, the developing of submarines and monitoring all the noise under there as it continues getting louder, it's all big considerations to take in, um, which impacts policy too. Um, I have, a question for Luca from the audience. Uh, you mentioned that in a few areas, the deep so far sh uh, channel should be weak, weakened. Could you expand on what this would mean? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, uh, I can. I can explain. Uh, so, like the way that I consider weakened is, uh, I take uh i calculate how large is going to be uh the sound speed uh decrease at this step compared with the sound speed that we have uh, that we we have around so like a weekend it means that the, the sound speed minimum is going to be smaller compared uh, with the past it, it means that uh if you have sound source in the solar channel uh it might leave the solar channel quite easily but also like another important point that also by, might affect uh, Gianluca's measurements because are, they are in the solar channel uh, is because the, the depth of the solar channel in the North Atlantic is going is going is going to change as well, and that's going uh, that's going to be like a quite important I think it's because I mean I'm not uh, like a biology as uh, as formation but uh, I think because someone in the audience can correct me it's like also like marine mammals they use a solar channel uh, for example to to communicate. And if you have a weakened silver channel, it means that uh, the communication range is going to be shorter. And if if the depth is going to be deeper, it's going to be also harder to reach it. I think for them because they they need to may need to swim longer. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. All right, if we have any final questions? Go ahead and pop them into the chat. Um, for now, I will just give a little overview for us. Again, we'll be posting this on YouTube if you missed any of it. Uh, thank you again, Luca and John Luca, for joining us today. Those talks were really great. And I think it's a really important topic, climate change. So everything related to it should be shared as much as possible. Um, as a reminder as well, for those of you who weren't at, here at the very beginning, we do have our research soundings competition coming up. So if you uh, want to create an audio clip relating to your research, um, please send it to us and feel free to be creative with it. Uh, pretty much the main requirement is just, it shouldn't have any speech in it. It should just be um, sound. And so we will be sharing examples on our social media in the following weeks uh, leading up to the submission date, which is the 17th. And we do have um, awards for winning uh, submissions, but it's just a really fun way to get creative with your research. Um, and email those submissions to us at underwateratacoustics.ac.uk. And as a reminder, if you have a talk that you would like to give at our webinar, or if you know someone who might have a good talk for our webinar, please do reach out. We have lots of ways for you to reach out uh, at our main email. You can email me directly, or you can reach out on our social media. Um, we love sharing anything in the acoustic world and getting it out there and trying to get as many people to hear it as we can. I'll just check the chat to see if we have any last minute questions.
and it looks like we're all good. So uh, I will thank you all for coming today and participating. Thank you to our speakers and to all the participants. And I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye.